All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Give you just a moment to settle in. Our next conversation is one that is going to be presented in partnership with the African Diaspora Art Museum of Atlanta, or Adama, who was founded by artist Dr. Fahama Peku. Fahama is also going to be leading the discussion today. He recently founded the museum as an innovative contemporary art museum and cultural institution highlighting the global black experience, with the, which mission is to present and advance the exploration and conversations around the 21st century contemporary art and culture of the African diaspora. Fahamo is joined by artist Kevin Sipp, whose foundational aesthetic examines the spiritual, political, social, and historical influence of the African-derived culture in the world, and Big Chief Demon Melikon, whose beaded work reflects a broad variety of stylistic influences, features imagery rich with symbolism and meaning, and confronts stereotypical representations of black identity. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. First of all, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Hey. Y'all can do better than that. How's everybody doing? Hey. <laughs> thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, thank you to Crystal Bridges for the invitation. Thank you to Valerie Cassell Oliver for putting together an amazing uh, exhibition. I'm really, really honored to be uh, a part of it and honored to share the stage with, with these two brothers who I've known for um, a long time. Uh, Kevin, I've known. For, for many years, and uh, Demond, we, we met not too long ago, but it feels like we've known each other for yes, a long indeed, time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so today we're gonna be talking a bit about um, African cultural retentions that can be found in uh, Southern art uh, practices as, as evidence in, in, in both of the uh, works of, of Kevin and, and Big Chief. Um, but before we get into your actual work, I wanted to just kind of get a little bit of background about uh, both of you and how you arrived at your, uh, at your individual practice. Because um, you both are, are in, engaged in practices that have uh, long traditions of uh, both ritual performance um, as well as ritual objects that are invested with like spiritual uh, energy. Um, so I'd like, you know, for maybe both of you to just kind of speak briefly about like how you arrived at your particular practice and aesthetic. Okay, you want to go? Yeah, I'll go first. How y'all doing? Thank you for having me, uh, Crystal Bridges, and thank you for Hamu for having me. Um, my practice goes all the way back to uh, 1992. Uh, my mom always brought me to Mardi Gras to see the Indians, so the black masking Indians in New Orleans. So uh, when I was a kid, I just was in love with seeing them. So one Mardi Gras, my mom brought me, one Mardi Gras, the Indians, I lived in a lower night ward, I still do. So when um, they came down St. Claude Street, when the bridges would go down, the bridge went up one, every Mardi Gras. So when they go down after we leave the Zulu parade, come home and play football in the street and the Indians come out. Mm -hmm. And that's our Mardi Gras, that's black people Mardi Gras. So it's time to go out again. So uh, the Indians just come through our neighborhoods and I, I followed them, I was seven years old. I just run out and go tell my mom, Ma, you gotta come on, the Indians out there. So uh, in 1992, when I was in junior high school, my, my, my friends, my, my uh, classmates, they were Indians. On the, on the lunch yard, people playing basketball, they singing Indian songs under the tree. So uh, March 19th every year in New Orleans is St. Joseph Day. That's when the, the Indians come out at nighttime. And um, me and my friends, we used to cut, cut school sometimes at 12 o'clock and go home. So uh, this year, this time, this day, my friend Marquis, he went home and I went home with him, March 19th, 1992. And um, he had an Indian suit in the corner. And that, that day we went out at about four o'clock, he put his suit on and people were outside going crazy. And I'm like, man, this boy Indian. I'm like, yeah, this my, is this my chance to get in. So uh, yeah, that night I went home one, two o'clock in the morning, my mom bust my butt. <laughs> and uh, and, the, and the, next, the next day, she brought me back, 1354 St. Bernard Avenue by my friend, my friend Marquis House. And I asked his mom, well, where my son was at? My mama, his mama said, yeah, he was with us. I told him, go home, he just stayed with us. 
So uh, that was the year that I, uh, I, I became an Indian. I, I stayed with them. I learned how to uh, mask and bead and, and uh, really, really it was about, it was the Tootie Montana style. It was the Seven Wars style, the 3D style. Mm -hmm. So the next year after I got with them, I met a, a, a elder named Ferdinand Big R Senior. So he was a, a elder in the neighborhoods. He was a, 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 a big chief of the Cheyenne Warriors. And he taught me how to be, he taught me how to be with a, a, a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And so in 1993, I beaded my first five boy suit, the whole suit. And I masked with the uh, Seminole. And since then, I've been a Seminole. So in, in 1993, I started massing Spy Boy and I started beating the whole suits. And in my city, on Mardi Gras Day, you have to be the best with your suit. So I was the Spy Boy of the nation from 1993 on to like uh, 2017. So that's, that's, that's how my, I come to my, my craft and my, my practice by just being the best with the bead work, with the suit. You know, I call it a wearable art piece, uh, more like a sculptured wearable art piece. More when I started learning about art, that's what I started telling my brothers in the neighborhoods, in the, in the tribes, that we should look at it different. So uh, I just, I just start, I was losing making the suits. The suits cost five to $6,000 a year to make it. And so we poor people, we, you know, I was saving cans when I, when I was a little boy and bringing the cans to the uh, recycle place and get my rhinestones and stuff with that. So that's how, that's, that's my, my craft, I was losing, man. When I became an elder and a man, I got, I started losing rental properties. I had, I, I just, uh, make the suit on Mardi Gras and just don't pay the light bill. The lights go, <laughs> the lights go off the next, the next few days after Mardi Gras. So, uh. You know, I, I was beating so good, Papa died, Ferdinand Bigard, so he died. But he brought me to Jazz Fest, and he was selling little porcelain pieces in his own booth in Jazz Fest. So I was taught at 13 years old how to go in Jazz Fest, set up your booth, and make all kind of works to be able to sell. But uh, uh, my, my bead work had became the best in the city. All the elders that was the beaters, they died and passed away. But I had learned from Ferdinand Big R Senior, uh, Felton Brown, uh, uh, Joe Scott, all the best beaters in the city. I just used to go by their house and, like I said, drink coffee, and they and they and they and they taught me how to bead. And so. Uh, after years and years passed, and I was the best spy boy, you know, the suits started breaking my pockets. I couldn't, you know, make the suit every year. It started getting, you know, hurtful. So I, I started beating, man. I started beating what I thought, you know, would get me somewhere. Because I, I made big aprons, some of them, like, half of this, this rug right here. I, I said, when I beat this with my wife right now, my wife is Alicia, I told her, one day when I, when I beat this, somebody gonna buy this for $50,000. <laughs> and I, I, I just told her that, and I, I had a, you know, a determination that if I beat my stuff, somebody gonna see it, and you know, somebody gonna help me get what I'm trying to get. So that's, that's really where my practice started. I started just from, losing and not being able to make the suits. Mm -hmm. So I applied for contemporary uh, uh, craft at the Jazz Fest. I was the first black mask Indian in uh, 50 years of the Jazz Fest being in existence to be accepted in contemporary craft. Wow. So, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, the first year, the first year I, I applied, I sold out. That's the first time it made me like $30,000. I'm like, <laughs> whoo. So I went home that next day and I started, I started beating again. I beat it, uh, that year, that year, I beat it, I, 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 I sold out. But that year, Arthur Roger walked through my, through my, uh, my boot. And I hadn't known about Arthur Roger in the city that he was the best uh, gallery to get in. I had never known about a gallery. I didn't know about uh, artists. I knew about painters. I didn't know about art galleries. I didn't know about museums. Uh, 
But uh, when Arthur Roger walked through there, he gave me his card. He said, man, if you want to do something, you know, he walked through, he left, and he came back. He said, man, if you want to do something, call me. So I, went, I called him, and I got a meeting with him. He gave me a year to do some pieces. I did every jazz great that had passed on in New Orleans. I beat it portraits, uh, faces, and um, he gave me a shot. He told me, give me uh, a year to make the, the work, and uh, do the show. It was for White Linen Night. Uh, two weeks before the show opened, I sold out. You know, wow. a soft opening, I sold out. So when the show opened, I had nothing for sale. So it was like, I was like, <laughs> what? I couldn't believe it. So, you know, that's that's where my my whole practice started. I, I started, and, and really, I'm a, uh, I'm a vessel for everyone in my city that's, that's going through the same thing, making the suits. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's a long story. I've been put on, on the NOTCF board now. Uh, last year, I was able to award over $100,000 in grants to the black mask and culture in New Orleans. So that's, 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 where my practice, that's where my practice started, and that's where it's at right now. That's what's up. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, for me, my practice started with my grandmother and grandfather. My grandfather was a brick mason. Uh, my grandmother was a seamstress. And one way or the other, I was always helping them when I was growing up as a child. Uh, my summers weren't spent as a teenager idling. My grandfather made sure I worked with him. So I learned how to work with my hands. And when my grandmother was sewing, I would help her cut patterns out. And what made it interesting for me, I was always interested in the graph and lines and patterns in that work. And so between the two, I had this idea of construction and mapping. Mm. And that became very prominent in my later work. And the third uh, big influence was the poker parties that my grandmother and grandfather <laughs> put together. Mm -hmm. And what I remember most about that was just the sonic joy of it. And so I fell in love early with this idea of music as transcendence beyond the church. Mm. And because when my grandmother threw a poker party, she had a friend who would force her children to bring seven crates of records with them that she had hand selected. And we would have to play the records at the poker party while the elders were playing all night. <laughs> and we would start taking the old records that were no longer in use and making art out of the records. And that was just something I did as a child, just kind of just having fun. Um, and so I was always making things with my hands, making objects. Um, so I never was really bored. And I, and, and I found out that through art making, you were always thinking act actively about how to transform the world. And that was in the midst of falling in love with comic books and falling in love with all the things that pop culture in America gets you to fall in love with. But my grandfather and grandmother were also people who had migrated from southern Georgia and had a very deep respect for what I call roots culture and tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the things begin to converge. As I grew as an artist and learned about art, I was always fascinated by historical spiritual objects from different cultures. As a child, they thought I was just you know, weird, because I was always buying books about indigenous American culture, indigenous African culture. I was always fascinated by the way in which other cultures represented spirituality. Growing up Southern Baptist was, I would say, minimal Southern Baptist, because my grandmother had stopped going to church, even though my grandfather went every day. But she was saying, she would always tell me, don't forget the roots culture. And I was like, here you are in the midst of uh, this American tradition where the gospel and the church is almost synonymous with black life in the South, but they were telling me, you know, there are other ways and other ways of seeing the world and have, a, you have your grandma tell you this. Mm -hmm. It was motivating to me, and she was really giving me the license to explore as an artist as a young child. Mm -hmm. So by the time I go off to art school and I'm trying to figure out what I wanted to be and how I wanted to survive as an That's artist, true. Um, I wasn't thinking particularly about success yet, because uh, when you're in art school, you know, they don't teach you much about that. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about ways in which I could sustain myself.
But the whole while I was looking, well, maybe I can major in graphic design, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. I end up in printmaking. But even in printmaking, I became a bit of a, uh, a radical because I was always mangling the plates and the lithographic stones. I was doing things like carving into them, which you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I was the uh, printmaking monitor, so I could grind them away. But I was always trying to make objects, and so I ended up taking sculpture under Curtis Patterson. Mm -hmm. And along the way, I, I, I just figured out this way of thinking and way of being and way of making art that kind of spoke to all the things I was into. And I wanted to build worlds with my art. I realized that. But what world I wanted to build with my art, I wasn't quite sure yet, because I was exploring spiritualities from around the world, finding ways to try and synthesize all those traditions. And then I discovered uh, the Ninkisi object, mm -hmm. which was probably one of the most profound experiences for me. And the Ninkisi Ninkandi object from the Congo is one of those um, what colonial culture called the fetish, but which was really an, an, a spiritual object of intermediary between the spirit world and the physical world, the one you see with all the nails in it. Of course, by the time the Ninkisi object comes to America, it has been demonized, and you have things like the voodoo doll tradition and all these demonizations of African spirituality. But when I saw that object, I immediately thought about all the indigenous cultures I had referenced as a child, and I realized in many ways this Ninkisi object was equivalent, and, and it was a radical thought for me, to the object of Christ, the nail figure on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I immediately equated the Ninkisi object with that, mm -hmm. this intermediary, this thing that you nail, but that nail activates the object, and it takes your prayers and your oaths to the divine. Mm -hmm. And you're hoping that that prayer and oath reaches the divine and it come back through this object to basically mediate justice and joy into your life. Mm -hmm. And so I begin to create objects inspired by that tradition. And then I begin to also seek other artists who were already working in that, tra in that tradition. And I came across the works of another artist in the show, Renee Stout. Mm -hmm. uh, her fetish two object, which still to this day totally blows my mind where Renee Stout took her own body and turned herself into a Ninkisi. It was one of the most, and, and I saw that it was Alvia Wartlow's ancestral legacy show at the High Museum. And I went to that show a thousand times because I was a student at the Atlanta College of Art, right next door at the Woodruff Art Center. I'm looking at this object and I knew that was my path. And then, as, as time passed, I graduate from school. I end up working at a place called the Hammonds House Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. And the first show when I was there as an artist in resident was a show by Terry Atkins, who's also in this show. Mm. And I'll never forget Terry Atkins coming to Atlanta. And he created, he brought pieces to the show, but he also created pieces specifically for the show. And one piece, he found a burnt out piece of wood from a house that had been destroyed, went to Goodwill and found some pearls and wrapped pearls around that charred piece of wood and stood it in the middle of the gallery and called it Billy Holiday. Mm. It was the most profound piece and it was so simply done, but it was so profound in its meaning. Mm -hmm. And that kind of also showed me a way. So Renee Stout, Terry Atkins, my research into African ritual culture, all that kind of culminated into me trying to find my way and my voice. And what I began to do was look at my grandma's poker parties and the music I remember, uh, my exploration into how to synthesize various world cultures. And then I also, being a, a child of hip hop culture, started looking at ways I could integrate hip hop culture into that because when I was coming into synthesis around all these ideas, Hip hop was in what I call the crossroads. I remember for Hamu, we were at a show together called Sampling an Incessant Beat. Mm -hmm. And it was a show about hip hop culture in Atlanta. But right at the time that show was uh, opening, I think Tupac was killed. Mm -hmm. And then right when the show was closing, I think it stayed up for quite a while, uh, Biggie Smalls mm -hmm. was killed. And and I was thinking to myself, how can I bring the idea of the Ninkisi, this healing object in African culture, 
and start looking at hip hop and critiquing it because I have a love-hate relationship with hip hop. Some people love it to death that they can't critique it. I love it so much that I must critique it. Mm -hmm. And so I begin to create objects inspired by hip hop culture and the Nikisi traditions to create ritual objects using the artifacts of DJ culture uh, to ask the question of hip hop, how can you heal yourself? How can you respond to all the negativity and create something positive? Because it wasn't all negative, but I wanted to address the negative. I wanted to address the misogyny. I wanted to address the patriarchy and find ways to move beyond it and make it something that was holistic for me. So that's my practice. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, man. I appreciate yes, that. Indeed. One of the things that's really like fascinating uh, for me about both of you in, in, in your practice again is this this notion of of ritual, right? In, in the ways in which you are uh, continuing to uh, explore and expand the way we think about what ritual is, right? Like uh, you know, Kevin, as you you, you describe um, your interest and in your uh, your practice really centers around ritual objects right mm -hmm. um, and you know as, as long as I've known you you've, you've really had like an encyclopedic knowledge of a number of like um, indigenous traditions from like Dogon uh, astrology to Yoruba cosmology and then you're mapping all of this onto like uh, black Southern traditions like the blues and jazz and, you know, Sun Ra to hip hop, like you're combining all these things together and creating these, um, these, these narratives. And I, uh, I'm going to pass you the clicker so maybe we can walk through some actual examples of your work. Um, but I, I, I've always really loved the, the story that you tell about your work with the, um, uh, Organized noise artist uh, EJ the Witch Doctor. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, uh, and the ways in which you were able to like not only uh, enlighten this artist who was calling himself a witch doctor, uh, but enlighten him through the actual creation of of objects that uh, amplified what he proposed or purported to represent. You know, as a rapper, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm a passionate clicker, and we'll okay. get into some of it. I think it might be. Let me see if it's backwards. Oh. I think that might, yeah, there we go. So there's the piece. Um, I always start the story by saying, funny story. <laughs> um, my wife, Unika Rogers, uh, was a stylist for the hip hop industry. We were friends for 20 years before we were married. So this, all this took place before. She knew I was working uh, with hip hop uh, cultural artifacts and what I call DJ culture artifacts and transforming them into ritual objects. And so she called me and said, hey, I'm, um, you know, I style for Gip, I style for Joy, I made suits for Big Boy, uh, but I got this project that I'm really invested in. I said, okay, what is it? She says, there's this rapper in Atlanta calling himself EJ the Wish Doctor and Organized Noise is getting ready to put out his uh, first album called Swat Healing Ritual. Mm. And I said, oh, that's good, he's on it. <laughs> so I was already excited just by that. And so she said, we want you to make a prop for one of the videos we're uh, styling. We're gonna bring in voodoo uh, veves, we're gonna talk about uh, ritual culture, and we wanna show uh, clearly that there are rituals in hip hop that are relevant to the world. It is a culture, it has a language, it has a spirituality, but sometimes it's all over the place and you have been investigating these through your works for a while, so we want you to create this prop. And I said, okay, let's see what we can do. What's my budget, first of all? <laughs> and, and what you're seeing here is not the fully complete piece, but mm -hmm. this uh, was a piece that Sheila Priest shot in my backyard mm -hmm. at the time. So. I said, well, let me think about it. Let me interview EJ first. Mm -hmm. So I went and interviewed EJ and said, well, why are you calling yourself the wish doctor? Because yeah. sometimes you unconsciously mm -hmm. give yourself a name that puts you in, sends you in a direction. He says, well, I was listening to this Steel Pulse song mm -hmm. and they got this one line in one of the songs that said, give me back I wish doctor, give me back my black ruler. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, okay. And I say, well, why did that term, why not black ruler? Why witch doctor? He said, well, I went and looked up the word and it was this ritual expert in Africa 
but they called him a witch doctor, but he was really a metaphysician. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, okay, we can work with this. So I, I went, I photographed his room first. Every young person in hip hop has their wall of respect, their eye albums they love, they, they have an altar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I talked to him for a couple of days, I thought about it, and then I said, okay, what are the artifacts of uh, hip hop culture that I can use? So I found a gentleman who built car speakers and I had to build three car speakers for me and I stacked them on top of each other and then I created this ritual uh, ceremonial mask head mm -hmm. uh, inspired by the body Gras Indian oh, tradition. I see it, I see bit. it. And I, see it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna ask everybody in Organized Noise to bring ritual objects to the piece. Just, you know, just give them to me. They didn't know what I was gonna do. I said, what represents hip hop to you? Some brought, somebody brought an old cassette, somebody brought an old CD, somebody brought some old records that they had scratched. Mm -hmm. And I began to actually adhere these to create my own hip hop Minkisi object of healing mm -hmm. for Southern culture. And when I finished the piece and brought it to them, they were afraid of the piece. <laughs> <laughs> they oh, this is real, I said. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm not in any way considering myself a, a, a priest, or, but in a way I realized I was channeling that energy. Mm -hmm. So I delivered the piece to them, and they were afraid of the piece, and they only ended up using the head in the video. And, and so it, they had it spinning, and I said, well, what are you afraid of? And then they said, well, this is some old voodoo stuff. And mm -hmm. I said, well, you calling yourself the witch doctor. <laughs> you talking about spy healing ritual. You what, what's going on? So I explained the piece to them, and they were so taken by my explanation that Rico Wade looked at me. He said, hey, you want to be on the album? I said, what are you talking about? I want you to explain what this piece means. And I sat down and wrote a poem. In about 10 minutes, I got in the booth, I recorded this poem where it says, uh, black music is black magic and we are in the spirits of the night. It was a beautiful poem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended up on the album, track number 11, Swat Healing Ritual. They put music behind it and it was a joy to me yes, because in a way it did what I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. It was an education for me, it was an education for them, and we came to this synthesis, and to this day we talk about that project because it was just such a beautiful project to work on, and it was my way of understanding how important and powerful art could be. There's not so much art for art's sake, but art for soul's sake, mm -hmm. and, and that's important to me. And unfortunately, that's why I don't make a whole lot. I, have, I get so invested in the importance of the, uh, these objects that it's not just commerce for me. Mm -hmm. It's very much spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy making these pieces. So that was the uh, story behind that piece. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you could share uh, a couple more uh, images. If you well, I'll go back to the previous one. So let's see here. This piece is called Microphone for the Zulu Nation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I I had a residency in South Africa, Caversham mm -hmm. Press, uh, where you also went. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I was hanging out with, in uh, the Natal with uh, a group of Zulus. And while I was there, I asked, start, they started saying, well, you should make art inspired by us. And I said, well, there's a Zulu nation yeah. <laughs> in, 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 in America, but it's a hip hop organization. And they said, oh, we love it. We understand because we have a tradition here of praise songs and they're similar to rap. And so they sung one of those songs to me and, mm -hmm. and they were stomping and doing the dancing and I'm saying like, this is gorgeous. So I ended up creating this piece in 2005 for a show in New Orleans at Dillard University. Wow. And I took that old Shure microphone and attached it to a spear and this idea of hip hop being warrior music. But what are they warring for? And so with this piece, I, I created a poem as well that talked about gang members being reincarnated lynch victims. Mm. And I wanted to speak to this idea of wounded souls are reborn and create wounded conditions. Mm -hmm. And this piece uh, had a subtitle, it was called Microphone for the Zulu Nation Step Up to the Ancestors. Mm -hmm. So I wanted the microphone to be higher than the average voice could reach. 
but you could aspire to that mm -hmm. place of transcendence, that warriorship mm -hmm. through meditation on his peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my practice, you see, there's a speaker at the bottom that's tur been turned into a Ninkisi object. The speaker mm -hmm. actually works. So we, I would have music coming out of it, but the way I wired it is that a person could actually attach their own device to the beat. So it becomes this ritual active object. It's not something that's so precious that you can't be a part of it. And I, this whole idea of bring your own beats to the, to the image was very important to me. So that's another piece in that tradition that I was working on as well. And if you can see, since I have it up far back in the corner, I created the ceremonial mother of hip hop. And that's a, a woman who's a combination of Little Kim and an African uh, priestess. And she's holding a broom, and the broom is topped with a microphone as well. Because mm. she's coming to just sweep all the mess out of the way. And she, is, does she have, looks like she has like horns. So it's yeah, like, she had, there's those ceremonial horns oh, from yeah. the Oromo tribe in, uh, of uh, Ethiopia. Okay. So you have all these. So I was doing a remix of bodies, a remix of images, a remix of objects mm. to create this kind of mythology mm -hmm. uh, that's rooted into this, this southern but global tradition as well. because. Hip hop has become such a powerhouse globally because when you trace shamanic culture back, especially when you're looking at indigenous cultures globally, it always comes back to a voice and a drum or mm -hmm. a voice and a beat. Mm -hmm. And that's globally. It's not just African culture, mm -hmm. indigenous Japanese culture, you can, Indian, mm -hmm. wherever you go, Russian shamanism, mm -hmm. where the root of the word comes from, you have this tradition of chanting spiritually over beats. Mm -hmm. and the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. In order to get to the uh, Elysian fields, you have to know the specific words of power or prayers to speak to get through one gate to the next, so it's battle rapping. Mm -hmm. So I'm always making these metaphors mm -hmm. between hip hop and a grander spiritual tradition that it connects to. I, um, I, I've always really appreciated um, as well the, uh, the, the, the idea of the artist as shaman. Right, like you know, this um, uh, uh, conduit, you know, which takes me back to his suits. Right. <laughs> I mean, your tradition. You can just speak to the Mardi Gras suit tradition. I, I, I don't want to take I mean, over, but no, that's, no, that, that's, that's, that's essentially the, joy the, the of question. It, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That living suit. Yeah. And, 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 and even to add to that, um, uh, because I think it's, it's equally important to acknowledge that that the suits are, um, have, uh, it's a confluence of um, African and Indian, uh, Native mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. uh, traditions coming together to inform that, that practice. And so like w within your work, the, 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 the ritual is really around like performance, yeah. you know, even, maybe even more so than the objects. It's a little more, it's, it's. You want to click it off. And you may have to click through a couple of, All right. forward a couple slides. All right, so it's my suit, uh, is more when I put the suit on. When I put the suit on, it's it's more like I'm being activated. So really, this is my 2019 Big Chief suit. So this is when I first put the suit on, mm -hmm. and so it's a video, but it's I'm not the Mar Malonso when I put the suit on. So uh, to be the spy of the nation. It's a challenge, and you, when you put the suit on, it's it's more like more like two 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 swans fighting, mm -hmm. you know, for the beauty, mm -hmm. for the beauty, and for the uh, the recognition of the city, and the and the and the black people in the city. It's just you know, it's it's like a basketball team. It's like hip hop, the best rapper mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, when I put the suit on, I got to know the best song. I got to have the best call and response to my spy boy because it signals in, uh, in our chants. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it signals in, in our movements to what I got to tell my spy boy two, three blocks ahead of me, Madison back there. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a transformation. And it's, it's spiritual and it's more, that suit, the whole yellow suit is Ethiopia. So. Okay. Haile Selassie on there, uh, mm. Aksum, uh, the Church of Lala Bella, uh, Empress Itega Menon on there, uh, monks from Antoto, uh, Emperor Menelik is on there on the Black Horse. Mm -hmm. 
So the whole suit is a, is is more. I call it the suit is named Ethiopia. So um, the whole suit is teaching my, my my people in my city about Africa because in the suits we always a lot of people so Indians killing each other, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what we that's what we call in response. I'm gonna kill you. So, but it's, it's uh, with, with, with being that pretty, I'm, I'm trying to show people within the suit that I'm gonna kill you with the pretty, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So that's why I so be so small and mm -hmm. tiny. It's a spiritual thing when I'm sewing, you know? Um, I sew every day, I don't stop. It's, uh, it's my suit is in Nkizi, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause I'm, I'm connecting with Papa with Ferdinand Bigard when I put it on. Mm -hmm. You know, from what he taught me, uh, it, it, it make you get chills. I just caught chills just telling you that. Uh, because, you know, this suit has never been duplicated. Uh, it, it's not beat. The apron from that suit was so less other be So uh, that's that's just... Uh, please, please repeat that again, because <laughs> I want to make sure they heard you say that. The apron... That means the bottom piece to the suit was sold at Sotheby's nine months ago. Yeah, so uh, it sold for a hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. Yeah, so it's it's I, I overcame uh, making the suits and losing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So really, really, uh, getting back to what what the suit represents. The suit represents. A spiritual meaning, you know. When we, I'm not only the only big chief in my city. You got 45 tribes that got a big chief in the city. So on Mardi Gras Day, it's our city, and we we transform it into Africa, you know. And and it's 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 the the, the Native American, uh, the First Nation people uh, resemblance and. Uh, we have blood of them mm -hmm. in us, cause I'm com I come from the Tunica tribe in okay. Biloxi. Okay. My daddy he uh, got Tunica blood, so I found that out doing my my research. So really, you know, it's a it's a very very spiritual thing. Back in the days, you could get cut with a machete in your head if you didn't know mm -hmm. signals. Mm -hmm. You know, before I started massing, my grandmother lived uptown, and Shakespeare Park now is a park. It used to be magnolia trees. And Brother Timble in the in the twenties and thirties, he was a wild man. He he come through and killed Indians. Mm. So it was a battle like that before Tootie Montana came. And Tootie Montana Tootie Montana suits were like King Tut walking down the street. So it's a it's it's a spiritual thing within the suit. But the B work uh, is more spiritual and more uh, connections to where we come from. Can I, uh, can I ask you to go back a little bit to mm -hmm. some of the, the B work? Because I think another thing that's really uh, uh, compelling about what you do in your B work is, is, is you're also uh, responding to the tradition of like uh, conventional like fine art practices like painting, and, mm -hmm. you know, making references to uh, artists like Barclay Hendrix, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, in your work. And, and, and it's, it's a very, very uh, distinct style of beading that you're doing compared to other masking uh, Indian yeah, in uh, the tradition. So my style, this is uh, this a piece that I just finished this year. It's uh, about, I think, 47 by something. I forgot what else. I, I just bead and keep on beading, y'all. So this, <laughs> this is Filakuti, and it's it's a, a painting of of Barclay Hendrix. It's called Amen, Amen, Amen. It just doesn't. It don't have the background. Um, that Barkley did on on it, but uh, my my style of beating, I am I made that up, I made that up. I, I uh, everything you see is my style. So sewing from six in the morning to twelve one o'clock at night, it just it keeps you in tune with the creator, and the creator comes back and gives you uh, magical powers that nobody else will ever be able to uh, connect to. Mm -hmm. And my work is, I paint with my hand, mm -hmm. with, my, with my needle and thread. Mm -hmm. I study you, I study Barclay, I study Kerry James Marshall, I study Kayende Wiley, I study, uh, I can go all the way back to Romare Bearden and uh, Jacob Lawrence, seeing Jacob Lawrence in this 
collection was one of my first times being able to see his work in my face. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the people that I study. I study Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. I love the way uh, the Florentine artists make stuff look magical. Mm -hmm. So that's how I try to do with the bee work and using the smallest bees is, is helpful to do that. So um, this piece changed the game for me in the gallery, you know. I, uh, I did another piece big like this, it's six feet tall. It's sitting in uh, Memphis in the Grand Central Hotel. It's a Black Moses piece. Oh yeah, uh, Isaac Hayes. Isaac Hayes from uh, the, the uh, Black Moses album I did. I beaded him six feet tall. So it's like, you know, I do this for my people in the city. Mm -hmm. For me to be here so that they, the youth and the youngsters know that they can do this too. Mm -hmm. And they can do it within the art and they can go to art school. So when I was beating young, I never knew nothing about no art school. Nobody ain't teach us well, about say, that. Well, I'll say, they go to art school. It's just a different art school. Yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, and then my, my, I won't lie, I teach, I teach a lot of youth uh, in this, in this, my, my spy boy went to NUCA, New Orleans Center for Creative Art. He went there for four years, academic studios, and he graduated. And when he went, he auditioned with his suit. Hmm. And so that suit had powerful meaning to it, and it, it got him in there. Mm -hmm. And nobody had never did that long as NUCA been in existence. Mm. So that's, that's what my suits represent. My suits uh, represent, I mean, my B work represents a style that has to win. Mm -hmm. It can't lose. So that's how I look at your work. That's how. Oh, my uh oh, we playing, y'all. Uh oh, if I could play it for y'all, y'all would love that. <laughs> oh, my spot ball. I told my spot ball. What's so Papa Dino? Kill a pretty white eagle. So there you go. <laughs> so, so that's me in spirit. Love it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I, this this wasn't a, a question that I had uh, prepared, but something that you uh, a comment that you just made about the, the 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 connection between what we have termed art and these ritual practices that, that uh, essentially we're all engaged in is a really interesting thing to me. You know, just thinking about what you were talking about with like uh, EJ the witch doctor and like when you brought these objects in, like it, it scared people or you know, the, the disconnect mm -hmm. that um, uh, some people in the tradition have between what they're doing and, and not necessarily seeing it as art. Right. Um, it's really fascinating to, to, to think about, uh, you know, the, the culture of black expression and the, the the chasm, right, that that exists between like conventional ideas of what art is and these productions that we have, and I, I, I guess I just maybe want you guys to respond to um, respond to that, and some you know like what what does it mean to to call yourself an artist when you're coming out of these traditions that have much deeper like uh, um, spiritual implications, right? Right? Like it's not just art for art's sake, but it's you know the creation of, of things that are designed and created to allow us to connect to something higher than ourselves. Well, it always comes back for me in going back to my grandma's poker parties. <laughs> Most of the records they played were what I call the uh, post-war blues. Muddy Waters and B.B. King and Howlin' Wolf's later stuff, but sometimes they play the older work. And I always remember my grandmother saying, don't ever let them tell you that our culture started in the black church. Mm -hmm. And this is a woman who was profoundly spiritual. She said, we were spiritual in the fields before they took us into the church. Mm -hmm. We were spiritual before the fields when they took us off the slave ship. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother had to drop out of school when she was 15 years old because she had my mother in her. But her older sister and younger sister went on uh, to Bethune Cookman College. Okay. So I was like three generations deep into going to college uh, by the time I went off. 
but she was the smartest one of all of them. Mm -hmm. And she was always analyzing and navigating how culture perceived her. But since she, from the age of 15, was an independently employed person as a seamstress, she never worked for anyone else her entire life. And people came to her because she could sew better than anybody in the region. Mm -hmm. But she always told me that your practice is your prayer. Mm. I don't care whatever you I do, should. whatever I work should. you get into, get into it with the mindset that it's holy work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you become an artist, so she, when she and my mom sent me off to art school, they said, never forget that what you're doing brings meaning to the world through us, through your ancestors, through your great, 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 greats who were never even on this land, to those who lived, who died here. Make sure that you're doing something meaningful and spiritual and that's, that's, that's joyful for you. Mm -hmm. She says, that's what my sewing does for me. That's what building houses does for your grandfather. We take pride in it. We love what we do, love what you do, but make sure it's holy for you. Mm -hmm. And you will never be sad about it. Now she said, you might have some tough times. You might go through some money issues, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, stick to it. Mm -hmm. So she grounded me in that. Mm -hmm. And, but when she told me our holiness didn't start in the church, she was telling me without telling me, like uh, Ramel spoke earlier, your spiritual traditions go way back yeah, in time, yeah, yeah. way forward in time, and you're just standing in the middle of the crossroads, mm -hmm. back and forth. Mm -hmm. Never forget that. Never forget where you came from. Never forget those who gave you the skills to do the things that you do. Like when you mention the names of all those who taught you how to be, oh, yeah. and then think of all the ones who taught them how to be. Yes, indeed. Uh, you don't end up speaking foolish like uh, Kanye on a black funeral. <laughs> <laughs> you, you gotta call it out. <laughs> I can barely sit in that thing because mm. I said these people are devoid. If you don't know your past, your future is going to be directionless. Mm -hmm. And you think you're floating in space, but you're standing on the shoulders of yeah. African ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You got to know those things. Yes. And you got to respect those and you traditions. You got to acknowledge them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, it amazes me how people confuse the, their egos with God. Mm -hmm. And I use my art to investigate that. Because mm -hmm. I'm always trying to critique myself, critique the world. And when I say critique, it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to investigate and interrogate because we are very wounded from the experience we had in this culture. Mm -hmm. And I try to use my art to get rid of those wounds. Mm -hmm. My art is a way to try and heal myself, heal the people who are viewing it. When they see that root winding from that drum, mm -hmm. people get the response I want them to get. Ah, it's simple, but it's profound. Mm -hmm. We came from this. Mm -hmm. And from this, we took this mechanism that was created by another culture and we even transformed that mm -hmm. and then it feedback loops to the drum and we get fella mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so you have this constant mm -hmm. call and response of spiritual traditions and then when you take it beyond that and go global with it beyond just the relationship between the african-american and the african but the african-american and the folks in japan the african-american and the folks in europe the Af you begin to create that world you want mm -hmm. the synthesis that is beyond religious dogma, beyond religious traditions, that's just about human beings treating human beings creatively well. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope for with my heart. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. So with mine, with my art, it's, it's, a, little, it's, it's a lot different. It's a lot different because the, the spiritual meaning within me beating every day for my, for my next suit, like I said, uh, it has, within those suits, the, the, the elders taught us that they have to tell our story, you know? A lot of people just beat anything, but me having them on my shoulders and me being the vessel that I am to be like I bead, mm -hmm. For the next generation, I have to teach them that where we, what, what you just said, where we come from is what, what's in the work and the work has to 
represent that for people that's coming to see us mass every year. Because within our suits, I'm, I'm the only one that's doing artwork, mm -hmm. you know? Um, people try, people in my city that's artists, they, they can't stand that. They can't stand that piece right there. They can't stand um, that I can run them out of Arthur Roger Gatter, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's, it's the, man, it's a ritual. It's a straight ritual 24 seven because I'm fighting them, mm -hmm. you know? I'm fighting them within the B work. It's, my, my, my practice is always a challenge in New Orleans, mm -hmm. you know? In New Orleans, um, the, the, the artists. For those with art degrees? Yeah, yeah. the artists with the art degrees hate me. <laughs> I can't lie to you. So I like, I like uh, having the strength and power to activate different um, protections for my creator. Mm -hmm. To set them on fire, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so uh, put, put, put it in there. So um, this piece, like this piece behind me, is called "When She Speaks, You Listen." Mm. So um, that's Amanda Garman, and everything that she speaks and spoke about, people listen, mm -hmm. and it meant something to me mm -hmm. in a serious way uh, because I have a daughter; she's 17 years old. So it's like, you know. Um, Certain things, certain things that I do within the B work, it has to activate a spiritual connection to everyone that, that absorbs the work. Mm -hmm. So the suits, oh, it's a, that's just a piece. The suit is a, uh, what can I say, a force field mm -hmm. of uh, a spiritual ritual that everyone can feel when I wear it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's deep because I know where I come from. The cotton wreaths that's on these pants that uh, Tremaine Emery uh, started with denim tears. I, uh, I come from Cottonport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So my, my family comes from Cottonport, Louisiana. My great grandmother picked cotton while my grandmother didn't have to pick cotton because her dad was white and she just sat in the tree and watched my great grandmother wow. pick cotton. So. Uh, that's why, I, that's why I do what I do with the bee work. I come from uh, the, the, the port where the cotton came through that's and saying. left. So it's, uh, it's, it's, like I say, I live, the, the, I live that spiritual meaning. Mm -hmm. Every day I live as, I'm, I'm the big chief in my neighborhood, so every day I wake up, I have to be on my, my, my meditative, Actions 24-7. So I listen to Fela all day. <laughs> and I listen to Fela, I listen to UK Roots, I listen to a lot of, I listen to hip hop and the only person is Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, he. You know, uh, because he's speaking truths and, and rights and knowledge. So with, with me playing my Fela and beating in the Bywater All Loves, Bywater has been, you know, gentrified. Me being the one percent that lives in the Bywater are love. Uh, man, it's the things feel I speak about and talk about, that's activated 24-7 with my door open, with me beating, and you know, I'm the only black man living in my building. So it's it's I'm I'm always 24-7 representing something that has to be where I come from, and when I bead, it has to represent where we're going. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's me. All right, well, I, I think uh, we're wrapping up, or we got questions? <laughs> okay, so um, I think we could take a couple of questions if anyone has any questions for uh, Big Chief or, or Kevin. We have one right here. Spirituality, which was also cut off by the Christianization of the, the, the Japanese, etc., the, you know, the 
kind of city? I, in New, shoot, we gumbo in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't, we got divine spirituality. That's right. So uh, Christianity was created, you know, by them. Our Christianity is the heartbeat, and the heartbeat is in the heart, is within. So when I, like I said, when I put that suit on, that has nothing to do with Christianity, but it has something to do with divine spirituality. So that's what we represent as black mask and, uh, black maskers in New Orleans. We represent a divine spirituality that comes from the elders and the overseers that came before us. So uh, we don't get blocked by no Christianity, <laughs> not us. Not us, not, not, and I'm not gonna let that happen because of who I am and what I represent, you know? That's why I be what I be. Um, I be, I try, I try to teach our people that we have divine spirituality. That comes from where we come from. That, like you said, that was on the slave ships. That was uh, in the cotton fields, you know? So, yeah, knew, we live that to, to this day. A lot of people in New Orleans don't deal with no Christianity. We deal with Africanism. We deal with gumbo. We deal with patois. <laughs> yeah, we deal, look, most of us, people think we from Jamaica, you know, in New Orleans. Yeah, we, we deal with reggae. We deal with Rastafari. Yeah, we, uh, it's different. It's different. And I, I, I won't lie to you, uh, I, I branded that on them. Yeah, I branded that on my whole culture, you know, that, we had to get away from uh, beating our people, First Nation people, killing each other. You know, that's not us. And that's why you see now when you come to New Orleans and you see the suits, people trying to be big, so big old suits like me and represent uh, a different meaning, beautiful and uh, togetherness, you know? Yeah. And yet for me, uh, it's always about, because I'm a, a ferocious reader. And I, I remember when I started the Ninkisi series, I've been turning turntables and various objects into it. Um, I remember them explaining the Nganga, the one who creates the Ninkisi. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh man, this is so hip hop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have this person who they say has to dress in the flashiest ceremonial suits. He wears this medallion around his neck with a mirror that reflects the spirit. And I'm thinking of Flavor Flavor and that big clock. <laughs> I'm always making these references. And then I think about Flavor Flavor and I think about Gede in Haitian culture, the trickster. Mm -hmm. You have these archetypes that live in these cultures mm -hmm. that are echoing all the way back to the beginning of time. When we think about Mardi Gras, people are now beginning to understand that that culture didn't start where they said it started. Mm -hmm. It can be traced back to 10,000 BC Nubia, mm -hmm. where you had the persons pull the ark out of the temple, float it down the Nile, take the entire boat out of the water and put it on an ox cart and float it down the street. Ceremonial carnival culture, mm -hmm. 10,000 BC. With all the characters that are there now, back then, costuming, masking. Mm -hmm. Masking for what? Community togetherness. Mm -hmm. To remind people that they have a shared humanity. And it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are. All that matters that day is that you are a human being and you're enjoying life. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to get back to. That's why I appreciate the culture he comes from, because it's one of the crucibles of African-American culture. Between African this and Gullah culture, and, it's like, and, and like Virginia, she said, there are places that have held on to their African spirituality despite all the things that tried to pull it out of them, taking away the drum. So they take away the drum, we tap hands. They take away the drum, we tap a broom, we tap our bodies, we tap our feet. We keep a rhythm alive. Why is that rhythm so important? Because that rhythm was tied to a spiritual tradition, mm -hmm. a heart. A mm -hmm. So when I'm making art, I'm always thinking about ways in which I can express that continuation. And it's not to demean a spiritual tradition or another spiritual tradition, but to understand that our spiritual traditions were forcibly beaten out of us, disrespected, uh, told, we, told that our spirituality was demonic, and yet the people who are telling this are enslaving us. Mm -hmm. Go figure. 
Your God wants you to enslave me, rape my daughters, kill my fathers, sell me here and sell me there, but you're calling yourself a spiritual person, a spiritual being, and that this religion represents your spirituality. We had in many ways to reject and rebel against that. And we did it through art making. We did it through our ritual objects. We did it through our hoodoo. We did it through our blues. We even did it through the gospel church because some of the songs had multiple <laughs> meanings and layers of meanings that totally overturned what we, they thought we were singing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I love about artists, this tradition of masking and unmasking, but also holding on to a tradition that goes back to the beginning of humanity and the beginning of time. Uh, so, uh, uh, we're, unfortunately, we are at time. <laughs> but as you can see, this conversation could go on and on and on mm -hmm. all day long. Uh, but thank you guys for your attention. Thank, thank you for you. being here. We, if you haven't seen the exhibition, we hope you get a chance to uh, walk through and get, a, get get an opportunity to actually experience what it is that we've been up here uh, talking about today. But uh, thank you again. Thank you, Big Chief. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, uh, thank thank you to you. Crystal Bridges. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.